Welcome to episode nine of Entrepreneur Life with me, John Campbell. And I am an entrepreneur. That beginning's really growing on me, you know? <laughs> I, I quite like it, I do, because it is what it is. And it may seem like that when I do these podcasts and these, and these, and, and these um, video casts, that there's no structure to it. There's no idea of what's going on, what's happening. And you could be forgiven for thinking that because that's kind of true. <laughs> I know in the very early versions, in the very the first couple of episodes I did, somebody did say to me, I go, you're a bit all over the place. And I was like, yeah, that's kind of how it's supposed to be because I'm just talking about things that have happened, things that are going on, things I'm experiencing, decisions I'm making, stuff we're doing as a business and as an entrepreneur and just where that journey takes me. It's about the journey, not necessarily the destination. So it is a little bit up and down like that. I do, however, keep a, a short list of certain subjects that I would like to speak about and things that I would like to, um, yeah, just, 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 just pick up on, really. And I try and blend those as best as I can or match them to how my kind of week is going or what's happening in my work and, and life journey at that time. And today I want to talk about um, decision making or, or more importantly, being indecisive or being decisive and the impact that has. And I think whilst I'm gonna talk about it for predominantly for business, it does also impact, as you would expect, in our personal lives and the decisions we make in our personal lives. Um, I think for me, it's easier to relate it to business because that's where I spend you know, a good chunk of my time, but also there's a huge impact in terms of the decisions I make or the decisions that get made, the decisions I help to make, very, very quickly in our business world. And I think the decisions I make in my personal life don't have as great an impact. And, and I'll explain that as, 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 as I go forward. So that's what I want to do today. Um, before I do that, I'm gonna pick up on something that I've, I've been thinking about really for a few weeks. It's, it's a conversation I have quite regularly with people about entrepreneurs being bored or being made. It's a conversation I really do enjoy having. And my belief in it or my understanding of it is constantly evolving. And every time I have a conversation with somebody, it evolves a little bit further. And I, and I really like that because that's, that, that's providing growth. And if you watch back, I think it was episode three. I'm not 100% sure, but it, it was one of the early episodes and it's called, you know, Entrepreneurs born or are they made? And, and I'm of the belief that, that you're born. Entrepreneurs are not made, you're born. And, and I talk a lot about this. I'm not going to go too much into it today, but um, I think that, you know, entrepreneurs are born. However, I think that the majority, where, I'm, where I think I was misquoted, and it, it was a misquote, but maybe I didn't clarify it well enough, is that I don't think that entrepreneurs are a very small select group. I don't think that. I don't believe it's the, um, uh, you know, there's a there's a, a select amount of, of, of people effectively, as I say. I think that actually majority, the vast majority of people are born with the entrepreneurial DNA. Not everybody, but with that with that ability to be a strong entrepreneur. When, when I say entrepreneur, I, I know it really links to business, but I don't think of it as business. I think of it as anybody that really has that drive, that determination, that belief, that gut feeling to just just push. You don't know where it comes from, but you just do. And you know, we could we could uh, put that across many many different um, uh, types of people doing different types of things, not just business. So I think majority of people have that, and and I, I'm going to give you an example in, in, in a second to prove it which is when we are born and we grow, <clears throat> at some point we learn to walk. And the way we learn to walk is we see other people do it around us. This is, this is my assumption of it. You know, we see other people do it around us, our parents, our siblings, you know, other people. So we start to learn to do that. What we do is at some point we start to crawl or we start to bum shuffle or we start to move. And at some point we'll start to get onto all fours and start crawling and at some point we'll stand. And at some point we will take our first steps. And every single one of us has, has done that. And we've taken those first steps and second steps and third steps and so on and so on and so forth. And you build up and eventually as you get a bit older, you start to 
run and, and those kind of things. You start to you know, do that. But at the very beginning point, you fall over. That's what happens is, you know, you, you start to walk and you fall over. Now, some kids walk with ease, others, you know, really, really struggle. Um, but majority, unless you, you know, unfortunately have a, have a disability that prevents you from being able to walk, you know, you learn to walk. And I don't think there might be people out there, but I've, I've never heard of, it, heard of it particularly. People that kind of just go, I'm learning to walk. Ah, do you know what? I can't be asked. I, I just can't be asked to learn to walk, so I'm not going to bother doing it. Or I haven't got time. Or, oh, I fell over and it hurt, so I'm just not going to do it. We keep pushing and we keep pushing ourselves until we learn to walk. It doesn't matter how many times we fall over. It doesn't matter if we you know, bash ourselves. And I, I think to my wife, who um, there's a, a great picture of her where she was a baby and she fell. I think she was walking and she smashed her eye on the table. She was a massive fat black eye. But that didn't stop her from learning to walk. She still went on and learned to walk. And I think, you know, that's the key thing that, you know, you go on and do this. And I think that for me, that learning to walk, that's fundamentally for every single person, there's something inside them that goes, I'm going to do this. I'm going to learn to walk. Now, it's, we don't know that at that age, but there's something in our DNA that pushes us to do that. It's the same with learning to talk and so on and so forth and a number of other things. And I think that to me showcases where entrepreneurship is ingrained in your DNA, which is why I think it's mass population. The problem I have and the problem that I believe exists is society and the education system specifically kick the living fucking shit out of you and they destroy and suppress and break down that entrepreneurial side of you so much that it almost just disappears. And I think for some people, what happens is it doesn't always completely disappear. I think for some people it just goes, just gone, broken down, gone. For other people it gets suppressed so much that they know they want to do something else with their life, but they can't. And they don't necessarily, can't necessarily figure out why to take a shoot off. Um, and I think that's part of that, that, that system. And then for, other people, like myself potentially, we push against the system. We go, no, do you know what? That's what I'm going to do. And I don't really care too much about what you say, whether I can or can't. That's what I want to do. In the same sense, if somebody said to you when you were learning to walk, you're not allowed to walk. You're not allowed to walk. You can't walk. You're not allowed to walk. Would you ever learn to walk? I'm going to leave that one there. Be really curious about your, your answers on that, your thoughts on that. But... Just to put that into, into, into you know, perspective, I think that mass population, entrepreneurial, it's kicked out of you at a very young age and through the next you know, 15 years of education system. So by the time you come out, you're ready to start a job and just do as you bloody told. Fucking crazy. Ridiculous world that we live in there. Um, anyway, let's talk about indecisiveness. So this is about decision making. So for me, as a business owner there's numerous decisions i have to make on a day-to-day -day basis some big some small um and certainly as you know i accumulate on compound days into weeks and weeks into months and so on and so forth some of those decisions become quite big and we do have some really big decisions and obviously they're, they're different ones at varying points and sometimes it's quite straightforward you know sometimes the little decisions are easy sometimes the big decisions are easy and sometimes they're hard um, the easy ones are easy. I know what I need to do. I know what we, what direction we need to go, and that's fine. And I've generally learned that through either making mistakes or seeing it done well in the past, or research, or you know, whatever it might be. But you know, the easy ones are kind of, yeah, I know that's what we've got to do, and off we go. It's the hard ones that make you double guess yourself, that make you kind of go, oh, that's what. Oh, do we need to do that? No, we should do that. Or oh, should we do that? And then what you end up doing is you end up taking advice from different people, which I think is a really good way of gaining perspective. And again, I'm going to talk more about how you gain advice from people and the types of people you gain the advice from, but I'll, I'll come back to that. So you start to identify with what 
decision you should make or which way you should go. Identify is probably the wrong word, sorry, I lost my flow there slightly. And I'm gonna, I'll, I'll give you an example of where this, is, this has happened for me in the last couple of weeks. I spoke a little, uh, two episodes ago, about uh, pay for our employees, for our people, and how I feel that uh, you know, a good number of our employees are underpaid. Now I can make the decision to pay everybody more. I could give everybody a 20% pay rise or a 10% pay rise, whatever, whatever that pay rise might be. But the impact of that decision may well be that in a couple of months, our business would not survive or we would have to lay some people off or we would have to cut costs somewhere to ensure that we can make our financial commitments and therefore the business continues. So that's a difficult decision because, you know, the cost of living is definitely increasing. People are finding it difficult. They're getting squeezed. Um, they work really, really hard and they're all really dedicated and I'm really very proud of every single one of our people. And therefore I feel like it's a duty that I have to pay them more. But on the other hand, if that's gonna fold the business in a couple of months, that doesn't benefit anybody. So that's a really difficult decision. What do we do? And, and you know, my gut feeling and, and the, the, the kind of the economic intelligence to me says, well, let's not give them a pay rise just yet because we need to make sure that we're sustainable going forwards. Another part of me, I guess that's my heart, says to me, now we should give them a pay rise now because we can afford it for the next couple of months. And by doing that, that will engage our people more, they'll be more motivated, they'll be happier, they'll live a better lifestyle, they won't be stressed as much because they don't worry about paying their bills. Um, and therefore, you know, they'll they'll be with less stress, they'll they'll be more performance, more productivity, that will help the business grow, and therefore it'll be sustaining going forwards. So it's a fine balance as to what that figure looks like. And I'm toying with that every single day. And at the moment I'm being quite decisive about that. And the risk of it being indecisive is do we lose good people whilst I'm not making the decision? Because quite regularly, not making a decision is more dangerous and more damaging they're making the wrong decision. So that's that's a tricky one. Another one I've had recently is really analyzing my time. And one of the things that I've been looking at is, is you know, really where I spend my time, where I want to spend my time, and how I break down my week and my days and my hours and, and you know my minutes and so on and so forth. And it's become really clear to me, I've known this for a while, but really clear to me that the time I spend in the, in the attraction division, so that's predominantly our jails, um, is not really where A, I want to spend my time any longer, um, B, I don't think I've got a huge amount more value to give on day-to-day -day operations. I think I can give a lot from a high level, from a strategic level, um, but from a day-to-day -day operational level, I really don't have a clue. Um, people have surpassed me, numerous people have surpassed me now in that sense, which is great. Um, I don't really enjoy it the way I used to, so therefore I'm not getting satisfaction from it. So I'm getting a bit kind of like, I guess, uh, removed from it to a degree. Um, and I just don't think I've got a lot more to offer it as it currently is to, to grow it. So, you know, the decision I have to make is, am I at the end of the line with my attractions? And therefore, do I need to move out of the way and bring somebody else in? Now, doing that is going to bring in a new role because somebody has to take over as a, as a, as a traction division director, which is currently a hat that I have. I've got it over there on my shelf. Um, fuck it, I'll even grab it very quickly so you can see it. Um, I'll grab all three of my hats and I'll put them on the table so you can, we can reminisce once again on my hat. So I've got my CEO hat, which is uh, as I wear for TCG. Um, I've got my... Uh, director of the attraction division, which is what I'm talking about at the moment. Um, and I've got my marketing manager for the attraction division hat. So this one here, the director of the attraction division, that's one that I've been talking about, uh, thinking about a lot recently and whether it's now time to bring somebody else in. And by doing that, I'm creating a new role, which is good, it's positive. A new salary, which is good, it's positive, but there is obviously that impact then on the business. And I've got to weigh up the decision between do I bring somebody else in that can do a better job than me, 
that's more engaged than I am, that can provide more structure and day-to-day support and growth and development of the business and the individuals that I can. Somebody that's going to enjoy it, which is not what I do. Um, and by doing that, I'm going to free myself up to spend more time as CEO. And at the moment, I still hold the marketing manager hat, which I'm, I'm, I'm okay doing for the time being. Um, because I, you know, there's aspects I enjoy and I, and, I, and I know it quite well. I think I still, you know, I've got some, some, something still to offer that. So do I do that? The challenge is, how do we bring in this extra salary? Because that salary there is probably the pay increase we would give to the other staff. So if we do that, what I'm doing is, am I sacrificing, and this is, this is how my mind starts to work, you're getting good insight now, is am I sacrificing um, myself by giving the rest of our people a pay rise and not employing that person, squish that, uh, by not employing that person, uh, by not employing that person, and therefore I'm gonna to continue to that role, so I save the salary, and I, I assure it, split it out across the rest of the team, but then the business doesn't grow. Who's that helping really? If I employ somebody else to do it and I put the salary into that and therefore nobody else gets a pay rise for the time being, I freed myself up, they're gonna to start to grow that business and I'm gonna free myself up and start to grow other businesses. And as that happens over time, we will then be in a better position to then give everybody a pay rise together. That's going to take a little bit of time. That doesn't help our people right now or in the immediate future. That might be three months down the line, four months down the line, could be six months down the line. Uh, I don't know because the person's not in place and therefore we can't see the impact they're going to have. So that's the challenge. On the other side, what if we bring that person in and they don't have an impact or they're not very good or our business starts to struggle financially? You know, where, where, where do we go from there? And these are the decisions that start to kick in. And this is where I think as a CEO or as a, as a business owner or as the person making these kind of decisions, it's hard because you're making a decision now that is going to affect 58 people because that, I think that's roughly what the staffing is for, for the attraction. So 58 people could are going to be directly impacted and indirectly impacted by this decision ideally for the better, but possibly for the worse. And you're just weighing up all these things. Now I can tell you right now, if I do nothing, I will burn out. That is a absolute certainty. I am very, very close. And, and I say this with no, I guess with a little bit of shame, because I should never have got to this stage where I am very, very close to burnout in this role because I've been doing it for too long. I have waited too long to move on and to bring somebody else in. And the reasons I'm not gonna go into now, but that is a problem. And now I've got so much that I'm doing, so many different hats that I wear, I can't give any of them the attention they need. And as a result, the business is being impacted. And I see that quite regularly now, like on, on you know, certainly a few times a week, if not almost daily, that actually I'm damaging the business more than I'm improving it. Um, in that role. So I need to really think about that because if I continue, I'm going to burn out and everything is going to stop. All, all, all the roles will fail. So that is fundamentally something that's really driving me to look at making this decision and coming to making decisions. This, that is exactly the challenge. All these different things. And then you start asking other people and it comes back around to, so I speak to for example, you might speak to your wife or your husband, you'll speak to some of your friends, you might speak to your parents, depending on your age, you might speak to your kids, you might speak to work colleagues um, and such like that. And that's all good. It's good to get a different perspective from different people. The one general thing with doing that process is you don't tend to ask people that have already done it. And, and, and if you're watching this, you can see me smile. It's because I've seen this happen so many times. I see it happen all the time, every day. And I've been in the situation myself. You want to do something, or you want to get somewhere, or you want to you know, achieve a certain thing, and you need to make decisions on that journey to get to your end goal. And what we tend to do is we ask people around us what they think and what they would do and stuff like that. 
And the reality is majority of those people were asking don't actually know because they've not done it. And I'll give you a classic example. If you want to be a millionaire, let's say you want to you want to be a millionaire, however you want to get there, but that's your goal. I want to be a millionaire. Stupid fucking goal to have, my ad, but that might be the goal. Do you ask Joe next door that gets paid 30 grand a year? Do you ask you know your husband or your wife that gets paid 30 grand a year? Do you ask your parents who you know might now be retired and got paid a good salary up to their retirement? Do you go and ask your bank manager who might be on 40, 50 grand a year? Or do you go and ask a millionaire? It's that simple. Like if 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 I want to be a professional runner, I don't go and ask my next door neighbour, who's not a runner, my ass. <laughs> um, I don't go and ask my next door neighbour, how do I be a professional runner? I go and ask a professional runner. I ask somebody who's done it. In the same sense of, uh, and another great example, when I went to build a wall, Emma and I built a load of walls at our house, I'm very, very proud of these walls, dry stone walling. I didn't ask, I didn't speak to people that had never built a dry stone wall. I've got a friend who's a brickie, and I dropped him a message, and I remember what's happening, I was like, dude, I'm gonna build a wall, I'm gonna build a dry stone wall, and then I'm gonna build another wall, and I'm gonna use limestone mortar. What mix should I use? How should I do it? How should I lay it? And he went, I don't know, because I've never done it. And I was like, oh shit, I thought you would have done it. He said, no, I haven't, but my dad has done this many, many times. So I spoke to his dad, and his dad said, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Now the information that his dad gave me was absolutely crucial to the success in how well we built those walls. If we didn't know that stuff, I guarantee you those walls would have been fucked up. Um, and that's my point. So coming back full round circle into decision making, it's really, really hard because sometimes you just don't have the person you can ask because you know it's hard. You know, looking for somebody that's done what you're trying to do. Um, the further along you get, the less people there are that probably know it because there's less of them. The more I, I'm not going to use the word success, but the more um, you're advanced on your journey, potentially the less people may have also been on that journey. Therefore, less people to ask. And also, you got to find them. So I don't really have anybody necessarily I can bounce on and say, "Hey, look, I'm thinking of doing this. What do you think?" Um, so I have to follow my gut feeling. And that's, again, back to that entrepreneurship. There's three things that I think make an entrepreneur. And this is, these are the three things that you use to learn to walk. You have that, your head about you, so that kind of vision of seeing people walk and going, that's, that's kind of what I want to do. I want to learn to walk. You have the heart in terms of you have that, that, that want, that love, that need, that, you know, that in, that passion for wanting to do it effectively. So they're kind of that, you know, I guess you could call it freedom. Once I walk, I'm free. It's like learning to drive, isn't it? Well, I can drive, I can, I'm free. And certainly for people like me who lived in a village with no buses. Um, and then, and everyone has this, you have the stomach. And that stomach, the piece in your gut is the bit that makes you get up. So when you've fallen over and you've bashed your eye, when you've fallen over and batted yourself and you're crying, whatever it is, it's that gut feeling that makes us get up and just push that little bit extra further. And it's that gut feeling that gets suppressed, I believe, in school and through education and through society. That's the bit that people lose. And when we talk about making decisions and going, oh, my gut feeling is this, how often, and, and ask yourself this truly honestly right now, how often do you make a decision and your gut feeling tells you to do one thing and you decide to go a different direction. Your brain or your heart take over, specifically the brain, and you go a different way to what your gut feeling says. And I bet more often than not, people go with their brain rather than their gut because the gut doesn't feel safe. It feels nervous because how can I trust my stomach to make a decision? But I tell you, from personal experience, every time I've gone against my gut feeling, I fucked up. My gut feeling is predominantly, I would say, 90% correct. It truly is. And when I, go, when, I, and when I say I get it wrong and I get it really wrong, 
it's because I've tended to go heavily against my gut feeling. And if you watched episode eight, that was my gut feeling told me not to make that agreement. It told me not to do it, but I went against my gut feeling. I took advice from other people, but I made the decision and something in my head just said to me, no, 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 let's do it this way. And I really fucking wish I hadn't. Really wish I hadn't made that agreement. I don't have huge regrets, but that is, that is something. So when it comes to making decisions and specifically things like this, I really, really listen to my gut. And it's always nice to have something to bounce off and to kind of think, you know, it's, it'd be lovely to have sometimes people to make these decisions for you, it really would. And people think, I'd oh, be great to be at the top, you can make all the decisions. Making decisions is fucking hard, really fucking hard. Um, because you make the wrong one, you truly fuck it up. So that's a lot of swearing, it's a short period of time, I apologize. Um, so I think in that sense, what I'm saying is be, don't panic about being indecisive. That's okay, it's natural. When you're making decisions, if your gut feeling is telling you something, listen to it, follow it, and have faith in following it because that is your core entrepreneurial spirit, taking you on the right journey to the goal. I promise you it is. And there are people along the way have tried to knock it out of you. And it's still there, you just have to let it out. Maybe that's a bit deep, I don't know, for Friday evening, I'm not sure. In response to this decision, because I think I should, I should, I should, I should round this up. And it, by the time you this is out and you're listening to this, this decision will be more public, um, and I will have taught, told my entire workforce. But that is the route I'm going. I am going to employ a director for our attraction division. From the first of July, we are going into a divisional model. We've been moving that way for a little while. We've spoken about it a lot. Our teams are aware of that. I am now actively recruiting people, a person, so I'm actively recruiting uh, people to get down to a person, to take over that attraction division. Great fucking role, truly is a great role. Very, very pressured, but a, but a, but a great role. Um, so I'm now doing that, and that's gonna move our business onto the next level. That's my belief, that's part of our journey, and I'm happy to follow it. Um, by the time this comes out, that should have all been announced in house. We should even ideally have somebody in place, although they might not start yet because of, of notice periods and stuff like that, but that is the plan. So we'll see how we go. Anyway, that has been episode nine. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Please do ping me your messages, your thoughts, your comments. I would love to hear your ideas or your thoughts around entrepreneurship and whether that's something that gets knocked out of you. We'd love to hear about your gut feeling on decisions. Have you gone to make decisions and gone a different way to your gut and why? Um, so yeah, ping me your messages, your comments. I will do my best to respond to all of them in a timely manner. Apologies if I don't, I've got three different hats to wear. Um, but yeah, I will, I will try and get there. So, and that is it. Um, and share it. You know, feel free to share this podcast, this video cast, um, and we'll see how wide we can push it and maybe even start getting more entrepreneurs back to being entrepreneurs, more people back to being entrepreneurs. Anyway, that is episode nine of Entrepreneur Life with me, Joel Campbell, and I am an entrepreneur. <laughs>